Welcome to Street Talk. Today we're on location here in Columbus at the Columbus Convention and Trade Center. It is Dr. Martin Luther King Holiday Celebration. It is an annual award breakfast that is sponsored by Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. We're going to take you inside so you can see what's happening here. It is a wonderful commemorative event that is taking place. And we're going to talk to some of the coordinators and possibly the speaker. Stay tuned. You're watching it here on CTVB. Securely and confidently, we want you to be able to use those machines. The goal is to have the fairest and safest elections in the country. The goal is also to make sure that every voter feels confident when he goes to cast their vote. They will be set up at a table in the lobby out, outside today for questions. I am currently serving as the president of the Panhellenic Council here locally, which is an organization made up of members of the Divine Nine here in Columbus, and, as, and one of our Panhellenic initiatives, also the voting initiative, and we're going we're gonna to partner with Secure the Vote to set up an opportunity uh, for the citizens here in Columbus to uh, have a hand-on experience with those voting machines, and we're going to do that at the Alpha House, which is 1015 13th Street, and I think it's going to be on the 8th of, uh, of February, but we'll have more information going out about that, and I think it's critical that Everyone is, understands exactly how the new machine will actually work. You know, uh, in the scripture, there was a question that was posed and said that is there not a cause? It's not a rhetorical question, but the question was asked, is there not a cause? And when you ask that question, you already know there is a cause. And there was someone who stepped up for the sake of others. But to have a cause, you have to have a dream. You also have to have a call. And you always realize that there's other people dependent on you. And so Dr. Martin Luther King 
had that same question that was posed, is there not a cause? And he answered that question. And he set the example for all of us as human beings, black, white, ethnicities, Mexican, no matter what, diversity, is that, is that not a cause? And he answered that. But I am so grateful that 34 years ago, Alpha Phi Alpha also had that question posed to them. Is that not a cause? And they answered the question. And because of that, we're able to be here this morning in a community that realize that our diversity is what strengthens us. We realize that we can come together and we're cut from the same cloth to make a difference, not just for Columbus, but also for Phoenix City, because we are truly one region. So the question I will ask you all, is that not a cause? And it will always be that question. But the answer is that we always have to step up to think of others more than we do ourselves. So the question is, is that not a cause? And I am so grateful to bring you greetings from Positively Phoenix City, right across the river, as I always say, rock throw away. But we are truly one region. But I would like to ask uh, if there's anyone, I think I saw uh, uh, our utility director, Steve and Smith, that was here. And uh, is anyone from Phoenix City, is any of our other council members that are here? I did see uh, Judge Michael Bellamy. I think, where, stand up, Judge. Where are you, Judge? Oh, there you are. Arthur Day, I'm sorry. Arthur Day, Councilman District 3, and Victor Carter Johnson, uh, District 2. And then see you as Michael Bellamy. Yeah, Judge Bellamy. Also, our Phoenix City Board of Education President, Dr. Patrick. I saw her. Sam. Thank you all for being here. Are there anyone else that are here from uh, Positivity Phoenix City? <laughs> anyone else? But certainly on behalf of myself and our city council and our city manager, we certainly like to bring you greetings for 2020. And may I ask you all this, yep. let's continue to raise the expectation, let's continue to exceed our expectation in this region, in this community. Because the question is, and the question will always be, that there is not a cause, and we have to step up. Thank you all so much, and may God continue to bless us. Today is a great day, for he has allowed us together once again in solidarity. I'm reminded by a poet who said, I have only just one minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse, didn't seek it, didn't choose it. It's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. I am humbled and excited to introduce today's guest speaker, Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, whom I first met uh, over a decade ago. A true messenger for God's children. Some things you don't know about Dr. Moss. He is a true example of God's work. For no one knows God's purpose for our existence. Once told he was not cosmocurial, he obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree from Morehouse College, a Master's degree of Divinity from Yale University and a Doctor of Ministry from Chicago Theological Seminary. He is a preacher, activist, author, filmmaker with an eye towards justice and equality. Dr. Moss is married to Monica Brown, and they have one son, Elijah Moss, and one daughter, Michaela Moss. He's an avid sports fan. The last time he addressed our audience, some were left mesmerized, 
so I'm hypnotized <laughs> and all realized. But on this 20th day of January 2020, he's back. And you know, as a young man in the country, when you went to grandma's house to eat, we would say, Grandma, give me a little of this, a lot of that, and for the things that were your favorite or favorites, a heap of that. Well, on today, he's back to give us a heap of that, which is God's message to bless our spirit, our mind, and our soul. I remember growing up, Reverend Donnie in the coaching church, before the preacher would speak, someone in the congregation would holler out, Preach! And the old deacon up in front would say, He gonna do that. <laughs> and he would holler out, Preach! And the old deacon would say, He gonna do that too. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I would say to you this morning to ask you to brace yourself for a ride like no other and join me in welcome back to Columbus, Georgia. The Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, Senior Pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ, Chicago, Illinois. I would like to, at this moment, if we could, as we uh, celebrate, without a doubt, uh, the greatest uh, prophet uh, that America has produced, one who was uh, a moral leader was, yes, a civil rights and human rights leader. But we should never forget uh, that Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who was birthed uh, from the red clay of Georgia, was a preacher. Uh, was one who was deeply rooted uh, in uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ and allowed himself to be endowed by the Holy Spirit. And so I want to lift up a passage of scripture. And the reason that I looked up this passage of scripture is, is because that Dr. King uh, preached a message in 1967. Uh, every year at uh, Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago uh, during this weekend, I, I take uh, a title uh, from Dr. King or a scripture that he used in a message and I attempt to uh, take that and present it in a contemporary way uh, for our congregation. But this uh, day, that there is, it's very, very, very near and dear to me, uh, that this scripture and also uh, the title that I will give in a few moments. Uh, there was, in 1967, Dr. King preached a message. That he preached several times, but it was the final time that he preached this message before he was assassinated. He preached in 1967 in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, he preached at the Mount Zion Baptist Church for a men's day. He was invited uh, that men's day to preach uh, by the pastor, uh, who uh, was my father, Dr. Otis Moss Jr., to preach the men's day, and he preached uh, from this text, uh, beginning in the 11th chapter of Luke, beginning with verse 5. I'm going to read, uh, beginning in verse 5, from two different translations. One is the NIV, that's the New International Version. The other translation is the OM3, that's the Otis Moss III version. <laughs> that will be out uh, next year, edited uh, by the mayor of Columbus. Amen. <laughs> so it begins this way, verse 5, uh, reads this way. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight, and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer. And suppose the one on the inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I ain't getting up to go and answer the door. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. 
Dr. King used this scripture and he preached a message entitled, A Knock at Midnight. But this morning, I want to uh, use this scripture but offer this title, A Knock at America's Midnight. A Knock During America's Midnight. I say to you this morning, beloved, it is midnight. It is midnight in America. The light of our mythic dawn has been replaced by the darkening skies of America's refusal to face her history and pull back the veil of social dysfunction lurking underneath our democracy. It is midnight. Something is wrong in our nation. On paper, our nation is an amalgamation of wealth, creativity, power, and alleged possibility, but this country built on stolen sacred soil of indigenous people is being haunted by chickens coming home to roost. It is midnight. Midnight has come to America in the form of Confederate ghosts, masquerading as political pundits who shout peculiar lies wrapped in the cloth of conservative mantras like, make America great again. One half of this nation is enthralled by this phrase. The other half shudders in horror at the mere mention of this statement for fear that men and women are offering incantations to return America to pre antebellum moments. And then when you raise the question, make America great again, I must raise the question, what year are you talking about? <laughs> this is this the year when I could not vote? This is the year before women were able to vote. It is midnight in America. How can a nation be so divided? It must be midnight. And all of us may be confused by the schizophrenic nature of our nation. But we as a nation had the wisdom uh, to elect a man of African descent as commander in chief and watch with joy a first family with buckets of swag bring a historic dignity to the office, while those on the right and left will argue about the impact of his policies. No person with a lick of sense can deny the beautiful dignity and elegant, epic grace of a family at one time that might have been lynched in America, but now will go down forever as engraved in the annals of history as one of the greatest presidential families that ever the White House. Say what you will about Obama. The truth cannot be denied. But there was a dignity, integrity, grace, intelligence, and spirituality that filled the halls of America's house in Washington, D.C. Is not God ironic? God used a family from the south side of Chicago to teach a nation that if grace is a color, it must be black. <laughs> For no political family in recent memory has handled ignorance, mean spirit attacks, bigotry, and racist questions of citizenship with grace and class. Maybe the legacy of the Obama years will not be health care and climate policy, but a national lesson on dignified leadership when you're dealing with undignified people. Uh, the words of my grandmother, maybe uh, there we were taught how to hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. <laughs> I tell you, midnight has come to America. I see the skies darkening upon the strength of our democracy. And it is midnight. You know that it is midnight when children are caged and mothers are weeping. Just as Rachel wept in Israel, so does Isabella from Guatemala as she cries for Jose and Selena. This nation of scientific advances, military might, and economic prosperity is the same nation, though, of health care, misery, opioid addiction, mass incarceration, environmental denial, toxic masculinity, and political corruption. It is Dr. King who said it this way, midnight is the hour when men desperately seek to obey the 11th commandment, thou shall not get caught. <laughs> According to midnight, the cardinal sin is to be caught, and the cardinal virtue is to get by. 
the text often used to deal with prayer. This one that is lifted up today is a scripture that frames prayer, yes. But this word is framed uh, by prayer, but also gives us a prophetic demand. There is a man knocking at midnight, knocking on a door of a home he believes should be open, welcoming, loving, and ready to serve. When Dr. King preached this message at my father's church, he stated, someone is knocking at the door, knocking at the door of our democracy, knocking at the door of the church, and at midnight looking for the bread of love. The church house, uh, the place where even the cynic and the skeptic knock when midnight comes, the house of prayer, the home of hope, should be the domicile of deliverance. The church in America finds itself struggling in the dark midnight of an unsure purpose. That literally we have turned Jesus into a trinket that we hang around our neck instead of allowing the power of Christ to move in our spirits. That our young people can't even recognize the Jesus that many are lifting up. Because there are so many preachers that preach Jesus but don't preach what Jesus preached. That there is a difference between these two things. And as a result, we are dealing with a moral midnight in America. And any time you are dealing with a moral midnight is when you have mass incarceration at a level. That is a war on those who are poor, black, and brown. Where we have privatized, privatized prisons and the idea of redemption is cast out into the sea of forgetfulness. Now it's strange that people of faith are so pro-prison when we have a savior that we know was convicted. That we deal with one, a Jesus who hung between two uh, malefactors, if you like the King James Bible, but hung between two thieves. In other words, hung between two thugs. And I like the fact that Jesus was hanging between two thugs. One thug was talking about him, but another thug said, when you get to your father's kingdom, please remember me. But what I like about Jesus is that Jesus does not say, do you have a letter of transfer? He does not say, do you have Christian experience? He doesn't say, can the deacons vote right now? He doesn't say, have you been baptized? He says, this day you will be with me in I don't know if Abraham's in heaven, and I don't know if Jacob is in heaven. I don't know. If, I don't know if Joshua is in heaven. I don't know if Samuel or Samson or even Luke or Mark or Jeremiah. But I do know that there is a thug in heaven, which means it must be a dangerous paradise. Jesus was one who knew stop and frisk, and Jesus was executed by the state. So in our day, in this moment, we must have an ethic of redemption and not see mass incarceration in terms of those who are stuck in poverty. We cannot look at it from the framework of criminalization. This is a public health crisis in our community. That the issue of incarceration is a public health issue. I, in Chicago, at the Cook County Jail, we have the largest, the largest in the nation, the largest mental health facility in the United States. I don't think you missed what I said. The jail is the largest mental health facility because we would rather jail people instead of having mental health facilities for those in the city of Chicago. But this is all across the nation. And any time that you incarcerate someone who should be in a hospital, you are dealing with a moral midnight. We are dealing with a moral midnight. But not only a moral midnight, but a historical midnight. We've forgotten the power of our history. The Spirit of God showing up in the lives of our community. 
Now that we are now operating in a day and age where people are questioning where is God. Uh, the question is not where is God. The question is where are you? Are you standing with God? Not that God is on our side. Because God doesn't work for us. We are standing on God's side, making sure that there is transformation in our community. Now let me break a few things down for you historically as we celebrate and commemorate the work of Dr. King. We love to talk about Dr. King. We love to talk about the Montgomery Improvement Association. Talk about that must Montgomery bus boycott. But we love to talk about the brothers of the movement. But the truth is that most of the workers and leaders were sisters. Let me help you out. Those operating from a patriarchal perspective, it was sisters that were getting some work done. Because when they, the brothers were arguing in a meeting whether or not we're going to have a bus boycott, there was a woman by the name of Joanne Robinson. Joanne Robinson met with some women over at Alabama State and said, let the brothers argue. We're going to put some flyers together, 50,000, and put them on the doorstep of everyone before 6 a.m. and say, don't ride the bus in Montgomery. While the brothers were arguing, when they woke up the next morning, they didn't realize that we have a bus boycott, but we never voted for it. And the sisters said, we already took care of that. As if on cue, 
God allowed the sun to come through and burn up all of the fog and they could see the tip of a white flag. And the captain said, hold your fire. And they boarded the ship. They boarded the ship and they were looking for white people. They couldn't find anybody white on the ship. They said, where are the white folks? Robert Small says that we are the crew of the planter. And we give this ship to Abraham Lincoln for the, for the Union Army. They could not believe it. Uh, they brought Robert Smalls to the, uh, up to Washington, D.C. Robert Smalls became the first captain in, uh, in, the, in the history of the United States to be a captain in the Army. Then he decided not to stay up north. He decided to go back to South Carolina. He went back to South Carolina and bought the plantation where he used to be a slave. And allowed the widow of the slave owner to live on the plantation. Not in the big house in the back somewhere. He allowed her to live on the plantation. And then from there, built four schools for people of African descent. Then decided to run for Congress and won and as a result became one of the wealthiest men in the state of South Carolina. Now don't tell me, with all that is happening today, that, that you cannot achieve when Robert Smalls didn't have a degree in his hand. Robert Smalls did not have all the resources that we have today. But Robert Smalls said uh, that there is a God somewhere that put something in my spirit that will not allow me to see my child grow up as an enslaved African. We must overcome our historical midnight, and we must overcome our moral midnight. But I must say to, to those of faith here today that we must overcome an ecclesiastical midnight. Ah, but there is a challenge, for the church is guilty. And I must say as an apologist for the church, a lover of higher ecclesiastical ideals, that we must admit in the 21st century, the church is under attack. It's under attack, not from the outside. Ah, uh, the worst attack that is coming from to the church. And the worst attack that keeps the church from setting captives free, from releasing those who are oppressed, and allowing the spirit of Christ to flow. The attack is coming from the inside. That there are people who are knocking looking for the bread of love, for it cannot be found in political systems, community organizing, and social media networks. No matter how many likes you have, your likes are not going to save you. I'm here to let you know that I'm not saying that we should not vote. I'm saying that if you vote, but you don't have a moral compass, then there is a challenge in the ability for us to organize as a community, we will be pulled by the undertow of a materialistic society. This is what people are searching for. They are knocking for a home. But we in the church have failed, and we must repent before God that we have failed and harmed the people of God. Repent. It is midnight. Uh, the man in the house is annoyed that somebody is knocking at the door. He's annoyed that he's curled up in his, uh, in his bed. He doesn't want to get out and help somebody, uh, even though there is somebody of great need. And I hear our children and young people who are knocking all across America. That is what Black Lives Matter is about. It is about young people who are knocking on the door, saying that we witnessed what our ancestors did. Where are those people of faith uh, where are you in this moment of need? Now, there are some that always uh, have issue with the term black lives matter. They say all lives matter. Yes, all lives matter, but the reason I say black lives matter is because all lives don't matter. Because if all lives matter, I wouldn't have to say black lives matter. So I have to say black lives matter, so all lives matter. So that's why I say black lives matter. So I keep saying black lives matter, so all lives matter. So let me say black lives matter. If all lives matter, I won't say black lives matter. And that's why I say black lives matter. knocking at the door. They do not reconcile a loving God with a self-righteous and judgmental people. They cannot reconcile
reconcile the power of grace with the condemnation that is offered from pulpits. They cannot reconcile a church that wants a tithe from the sisters but will deny them the right to preach. They cannot reconcile a church that wants to pimp a gay person's gifts but then deny their existence. You can work in the choir but then get back in the closet after that. It is midnight. If the church is to be a place where Jesus is sovereign, we must not only repent, but we must reconcile. We must be reconciled by God. We need to be saved all over again. I said it, the church needs to be saved all over again. Let me say it again, the church needs to be saved all over again. We need to fall on our knees at the mortar's bench and allow the spirit to tear it. I did not say just preachers, I said everybody on the inside of the church, everybody who left the church, everybody who's ambivalent about the church, we have all been a part of this problem. Uh, you see, we have decided, when we decide to repent and we reconcile, then watch God do God's work. And if we are to see the dawn, it will be black, brown, and indigenous people of faith. Those who have been discarded by society, but yet still bringing the bread of love in society. We need a Pentecost moment, a revival of the spirit that will change this nation. Uh, there is something about midnight that I forgot to tell you. I've got to close right now, but I've got to give you the good news, and I've got to give you the bad news. Bad news is, it's midnight. Good news is, it's midnight. You missed your shout. Bad news is, it's midnight. Good news is, it's midnight. You still missed your shout. Bad news is, it's midnight. The good news is, it's midnight. You missed your shout. The bad news is, it's midnight. The good news is, it's midnight. Let me help you out. You see, the bad news is midnight. It's the darkest time of the night. It's an equal distance between light and light. But the good news is, it's midnight. Because after you leave 1159 and you step into midnight, it means that the new day.
by leading efforts to raise monies for hundreds of scholarships for high school seniors. The 2020 Unity Award recipient has tackled many obstacles and overcome them all during his life and ascension in the political arena. The 2020 award recipient has and continues to be an advocate for equality and opportunity for all people. The 2020 Unity Award recipient has successfully led efforts to ignite economic development in his community. The 2020 Unity Award recipient is none other than is none other than <laughs> none other than um, a person who stood before you this morning and he asked a question is there not a cost he told you that it's a rhetorical question and this recipient for 2020, I believe, has answered the question. The Alpha Onward and Upward Foundation, Inc. presents the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Unity Award to the Honorable say this, I, uh, I, am, I am shocked. You know, I was always taught that when you do something, you do it for the right reason and you don't even look for a thank you. Um, and, you know, I, I just believe that you always should give. And my pastor, who I wish was here, is teaching me uh, not to stop other people's blessings for doing for you. I'm learning that, but I, um, I'm surprised. Thank you all. Thank you, Alpha Phi Alpha. I really didn't see this coming, but I am grateful and thankful that uh, for this award because we are all cut from the same cloth, and we do need each other. And I always say the quickest way to get ahead is to build other people up around you. It's one region, and I thank you all so very, very much, but it is hard for me to sometimes accept awards and get things uh, received back to me, and my pastor is working with me on that because he always says, don't stop other people blessing. Oh, yeah. Because I'm the one that likes to give and give and do it for the right reason, and I certainly, certainly appreciate this award. You all surprised me. Thank you all so much, and let's continue to exceed the expectation for our region by loving each other, thinking of each other more than we do ourselves. And before I go sit down, I always say this, the greatest model to ever follow is the model of Jesus Christ. And that is to think of others more than you do yourselves. Mayor Eddie Lowe, we're so happy, and you are all about love and unity. I, I tell you, I was totally surprised. 
Uh, I, I really appreciate it, and I'm learning more and more to receive things from people, as I stated, because I believe so much in giving and not looking for anything. But uh, my pastor is working with me on that, too. To not to stop other people blessing, but I am so grateful, uh, Loretta, and, and I just just want to thank God and thank these communities and, and thank everyone for thinking enough of me for this. I tell you, this right here say a lot about your leadership, and it makes me emotional because I have seen your leadership over the years, and when they mm -hmm. describe the reasoning behind this, it is all you. Well, uh, again, it has to always be about people and about other people. And I always try to live that and, and really want to make a difference for other people. And that's why we are created. And I just enjoy it. And like I say, I'm having fun by being the mayor and doing this because I love people. And I really want to make a difference for the right reason. But I am so thankful. I'm thankful for Phoenix City. I'm thankful for this award. I'm just so thankful that we can come together for a common good because the quickest way for any community or anyone to get ahead is to build the people up around. Build the people up around. Yes. So you've heard it from Positively Phoenix City Mayor Eddie Lowe. We have got to build up the people around us. That's how we all get ahead. You're watching it here on cable TV. Thank you so much. You have brought a dynamic message Thank you. to the city. Thank you. We have been tremendously blessed. I just want to say, re reiterate what you said. Today is a new day. Yes, absolutely. The young people are calling out. They're knocking at the door. Yes, they are. Tell us why is that is just so important to get to the people. I think it's incredibly important that we recognize that there is an excited, creative, intelligent, and also frustrated generation that deeply wants to connect with the previous generation, and they want to reshape democracy. And I'm really excited to see these young activists who are deeply loving, caring, and want to be connected uh, with their grandparents and with their parents uh, to see a new day in the United States. Wow. When you were up here, you embodied the character of Dr. Martin Luther King. I know you made him proud. Oh, you made that, us that's, all that, proud. that's so very kind. It is I the really truth. appreciate it is that. The truth. That is a very high compliment. I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for delivering such a heartfelt message. Thank you. Inspiration, encouragement, hope, and we all are just inspired to just continue oh, to do more. Well, it was a delight to be in the celebrated city of Columbus. And <laughs> I love that. Yes. And uh, it is just a wonderful program that Alpha Phi Alpha does. I want to thank them uh, for putting this together, the scholarship programs that they have done, and commemorating Dr. King, not just celebrating, but commemorating the work. Uh, that the work is not done, uh, and that he was a radical, revolutionary man who was transformative, transforming uh, the social landscape of our country. Absolutely. Well, you've heard it from Dr. Moss, all the way from Chicago, Illinois. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. This is what's happening here in Columbus. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's show. It is Dr. Martin Luther King holiday celebration here in Columbus at the Columbus Convention and Trade Center. I know you have been inspired. We appreciate you for tuning in to CTV Beam here on cable TV and coming out of Phoenix City.